Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So let's uh, conclude our uh, discussion of female impersonation in uh, Parsi theatre. Uh, we ended uh, the last session with uh, uh, our uh, uh, discussion of Bal Gandharva's uh, performance uh, techniques. Um, we, all, we saw how in the case of both uh, Sundari as well as Bal Gandharva, uh, they are sartorial, they are dressed, the clothes they wore, their gestures, their jewellery, they all had multiple uh, meanings that were contingent on the dramatic text and the performative realisation of this dramatic text and the speaker's social location and interpretive apparatus. So, we saw how, for example, uh, Bal Gandharva's rather uh, seductive um, uh, posturing and uh, behavior on stage, uh, including uh, his untied hair, the act of braiding his hair, the act of uh, removing his blouse, uh, were not necessarily read as crude, but they were actually seen as uh, signs of uh, female, female modesty. Right? Um, they were seen as modest and charming representations of the educated young women of the day. Uh, his songs especially were known for their emotional uh, expressivity, expressivity and um, they evoked certain emotions of romance and pathos of Sringara and Karuna Rasa. The voice also was in some sense uh, between a male and a female uh, vocal register and um, there was this uh, natural wonder that was evoked uh, from Bal Gandharva's performance um, and uh, that itself created uh, an adbhuta rasa, right? a, a, a kind of an emotion of wonder at uh, the ways in which uh, Bal Gandharva was able to pass off successfully as a woman. And it's, uh, it's important to also uh, consider the fact that uh, the uh, Bal Gandharva and uh, Sundari were also um, in some sense challenging an easy understanding of uh, the transvestite as uh, somebody who just uh, thinly veils or cloaks uh, an aggressive heterosexual masculinity. Right? The transvestite was more interpreted as a woman or as identifying emotionally with a woman um, even though he is still biologically a man. And so the transvestite is not seen as somebody who threatens female honor or uh, a family, but um, is also seen as someone who, uh, you know, may uh, in some sense also be uh, a source of, um, of deception, right? of, of, uh, of uh, the um, uh, scenarios where you have uh, men dressed in women's clothing right, uh, who were uh, seen to be uh, um, uh, trying to access their lovers through uh, cross-dressing, right? But uh, here you have, um, uh, you know, an attempt to pass off as a woman and not, uh, and never actually get out of character, right? So these uh, men who performed cross-dress as women were remained women right in their performances uh, although uh, there was this clear um, uh, comment being made on the fact that it was it was the men the male actors who cross dressed as women they were the ones who actually ended up governing uh, uh, and ruling over what constituted femininity and and uh, and uh, female behavior right. so um, 
both Sundari and Bal Gandharva um, embodied a highly mimetic mode of female impersonation. Right? So Sundari also, his acting method uh, was based on the identification with feminine sensibility. Uh, and um, uh, the actors very clearly try to disguise their uh, male uh, characteristics. Uh, so, for example, uh, Sundari played a number of roles um, which were uh, directed to the female uh, spectatorship um, in the audience. And so he was, in some sense, for example, he played the role of the tragic woman of the wronged wife of the victim and uh, so the female impersonator was rendered uh, non-threatening because he was someone who evoked um, sympathy and uh, tears from the audience rather than um, sexual excitement or titillation. So it was possible for the female impersonator to uh, portray a certain social ideal of femininity which uh, went beyond um, uh, social stigma and and the threat of uh, of uh, violence or um, uh, or uh, disrepute. So the female impersonator was was in some sense uh, seen as someone who surpassed uh, any woman in his representation of the beauty of womanly suffering. And. Um, uh, Catherine Hansen, in her essay on uh, cross-dressing, also points to the possibilities of homoeroticism that existed between uh, the female, uh, the, the male transvestite and uh, the, the male hero uh, or the male protagonist of the play. So you have, for example, instances of uh, this kind of uh, romance uh, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, Indar Sabha, the famous Urdu play Indar Sabha that I mentioned in the last session where uh, you know uh, one of the uh, actors uh, comments on how uh, thousands of people uh, became captivated and went mad over these beautiful beardless youths these young men whose voices had probably not cracked who had still not acquired beards were playing female roles and uh, so there is always this possibility that uh, in these plays, especially when these Urdu plays were drawing from certain Urdu repertoires, uh, Persian, uh, Perso Arabic repertoires of um, uh, same sex uh, 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 love and pederasty, that um, uh, you had uh, instances of uh, men in the audience falling in love with uh, young boys who played female roles. So, uh, there are other instances where, for example, uh, the uh, sight of Bal Gandharva playing Shakuntala um, uh, uh, evoked the lusty applause of the audience. This is again a quote from Catherine Hansen's essay. So, um, it's important also to uh, note that the, uh, that the institution of female impersonation was uh, made made uh, the uh, image of woman uh, publicly available right the the respectable image of the woman uh, was constructed and one that was used b by both men and women in the uh, in the audience right. so uh, the there was an interesting um, uh, you know uh, shift in uh, uh, the representation and perception of these uh, female uh, transvestites on stage right? because the shift was uh, in the fact that um, that uh, that for once um, there was this um, uh, these external markers of femininity especially in terms of the sari style the hairdo and jewelry um, it's the male actors who played women who idealized and became uh, marked the uh, fashion statements for many other women who came to emulate or imitate these men. Right? So they actually became uh, ideal models of femininity through their own observations of uh, the contemporary and latest styles and fashions. And so uh, women uh, were largely kept away from uh, this process of gender formation uh, in many senses. So uh, women were denied employment uh, under in the world of entertainment 
and there was also an intensification of uh, misogyny um, because women had to be held off stage and out of the public eye. Right? So it was really uh, the men uh, in the theatre system who, uh, and the public who actually served to perpetuate the, uh, the long-standing control that uh, men had over female bodies and their representation. Um, so the other process that we that I mentioned in the last session was the fact that you also had uh, non-Hindu women, especially Anglo-Indian and uh, Jewish women who played actresses on stage. And this was a process that went hand in hand with the figure of, uh, of the female impersonator. So uh, here you see Anglo-Indian actresses um, being perceived as foreign and yet uh, passing off as the ideal uh, Indian woman. So she was in some sense a, a hybrid, right? She was uh, on one hand, she had fair skin and she had the promise of so-called modern ways. But at the same time, she was also someone who uh, uh, attempted, uh, who was made to pass off as, uh, as um, uh, a Hindu or an Indian woman. Uh, so she could be seen as someone who possessed uh, an, an exotic allure uh, and uh, this of course came through in the uh, images of these Anglo-Indian and Jewish actresses on billboards and magazines and so on. Uh, so the images also circulated and uh, that in some sense was a source of excitement among the uh, audience and the male and the men of the audience especially. Um, so she was a, uh, a, a very evident source of um, uh, spectatorial pleasure. And um, there were lots of tensions uh, when uh, Jewish actresses and Anglo-Indian actresses were first introduced on stage, especially from among uh, major playwrights uh, of the time. Uh, one, of course, was K.N. Kabra, the eminent uh, Gujarati playwright, uh, 1842 to 1904 who belonged, uh, who was a prominent uh, Parsi social reformer. And so while on the one hand, Cabra um, argued for the independence of Parsi women, uh, he also uh, discouraged their participation on stage. So um, he, uh, of course, made, uh, um, uh, uh, he made it possible for Parsi women to come to theatres, uh, preferably accompanied by uh, their husbands or brothers. Uh, he also had crashes uh, by uh, outside the theater, the theatrical space for uh, young mothers to leave their children. And uh, when he founded the Natak Uttejak Mandal, he uh, offered uh, he also offered uh, women only performances. Right? But there was still there was still a lot of res resistance to, uh, for example, the arrival of courtesan performers on stage. So he resisted uh, the entry of courtesans in uh, in the acting profession. So it's it's so it, it there was a very ambiguous response uh, from Cabra to the introduction of women. Uh, for as long as they performed respectable roles, they were uh, tolerated or they were perhaps encouraged. But then uh, uh, the arrival of courtesan performers, many of whom were uh, were Muslim, uh, there was uh, a, a strong uh, resistance to their presence on stage. Um, there was a similar resistance also expressed by the new Alfred Theatrical Company, uh, which again uh, declared its opposition to women performing on stage. Um, and the new Alfred Company, which, uh, which uh, uh, emerged in the late uh, 19th century, was also uh, sponsored and uh, patronized by uh, nationalist leaders like Madan Mohan Malviya and Motilal Lehru for uh, their most, uh, uh, for their performances because they were seen to be uh, one of the most orthodox and respectable uh, Parsi troops. Um, and then uh, you, around 1880, uh, one of the uh, important uh, playwrights, right, um, uh, Dadi Patel, whom I mentioned earlier, who was the, uh, the manager of the Victoria Theatrical Company, uh, was um, traveling with his troupe across the country, even before railroads were available. And he was, uh, he had brought along with him um, several Hyderabadi singers. Um, and so he used these female singers in his 87, 18, 1875 production of the Indra Sabha. 
uh, turning uh, fairies into females and so on. Right? Um, then another important uh, playwright, Baliwala, brought women into the Victoria Company in 1880, uh, beginning with Miss Gohar, uh, who was followed by a, a host of other women, Miss Malka, Miss Fatima, Miss Khatun, and so on. And uh, many of these women also um, uh, assumed uh, Hindu names uh, to pass off as, uh, as Hindu. And um, it's, uh, it, it was still uh, rare, an exception to see a Parsi woman acting on stage. Then you also had uh, the most important uh, Anglo-Indian uh, female uh, actor, um, Mary Fenton, uh, who um, uh, in contrast to, let's say, the other women who uh, acted on stage, Latifa Begum, Moti Jan, or Miss Fatima, um, was a, an Anglo-Indian woman. And um, she um, was herself the daughter of a retired Irish soldier. She was an entertainer. And um, she did magic shows. And um, she was known for uh, her singing abilities her accurate pronunciation of Urdu and her acting talent, of course. And so she became a very important uh, and uh, famous uh, actress um, uh, because of her beauty, her fair beauty, her fair skin, her ability to uh, pronounce uh, Urdu well and to sing. And um, so uh, it's in her that you see an instance of racial boundaries being blurred. And um, there were many other actresses too who uh, came from the Baghdadi Jewish community uh, who had immigrated to India in the 19th century. Uh, many of them again assumed Hindu names like Sulochana, who was Ruby Myers, Sita Devi for Rennie Smith, Indra Devi for Effie Hippolyte, Manorama for Winnie Stewart and so on. So the Anglo-Indian actress uh, added glamour and excitement to the theater, which was already synonymous with spectacle. Uh, Catherine Hansen makes this very interesting observation where she says that it was through the exercise of the gaze that the male Indian spectator could possess the English beauty and enact a reversal of the power relations that prevailed in British dominated colonial society. These relations while grounded in economic and political control were figured as a gender domination of the West. The Anglo Indian actress was now domesticated. Uh, and subordinated to the Indian hero and to the male viewer's gaze. Um, let me just repeat that quote. Um, Through the exercise of the gaze, the male Indian spectator could possess the English beauty and enact a reversal of the power relations that prevailed in British dominated colonial society. These relations were grounded in economic and political control, were figured as a gender domination of the masculine West over the feminine East. Instead, the feminine embodiment of the West, the Anglo-Indian actress, was now domesticated and subordinated to the Indian hero and to the male viewer's gaze. This inversion became such an integral part of domestic comedies and melodramas that playwrights were required to craft their narratives accordingly. So you see uh, an interesting shift, a reversal there, where initially you had um, you know, a male Indian spectator who could possess uh, English beauty and enact the reversal of power relations that prevailed in British-dominated colonial society. So while you had uh, a, a masculine colonial gaze and a feminized, uh, uh, colonized uh, society, here you have uh, the, the, the male Indian gaze uh, capturing or possessing the uh, English beauty of the actresses, of the Anglo-Indian actresses on stage, which had been now subordinated and domesticated. And as I mentioned earlier, there were these uh, afterlives of the Anglo-Indian actress that existed through the circulation of their images uh, on billboards and um, clothes even, uh, and, and photographs. And uh, they were an important uh, trace that these actresses left of their um, beauty and uh, lure. And Mary Fenton, of course, was herself very famous because she was able to imitate the signs of respectable married women, of using the sari to drape her head, the jewelry, the particular cut of the bodice, and so on. Right. So that was our uh, discussion of uh, uh, the 
male, uh, the, the twin processes of female impersonation as well as the, um, the figure of the Anglo-Indian and the Jewish actress uh, making their presence felt on stage as uh, a way of um, uh, performing uh, domesticated, respectable bourgeois femininity while at the same time possessing uh, a different kind of a Western fair beauty um, along with um, a, a linguistic prowess and singing abilities, uh, which made them particularly attractive to the uh, Indian male audience. Um, it's also important now to then look at some of the folk traditions that have contributed to uh, Indian, uh, modern Indian theatre. Um, again, to draw from uh, Catherine Hansen and uh, uh, Anuradha Kapoor as well as Aparna Dharvadkar's work on uh, modern Indian theatre. Uh, here, uh, it would be interesting to uh, look at the status of Indian folk theatre in the history of modern Indian theatre. So here you see that um, uh, there were many, uh, India possessed many uh, folk traditions like Yakshagana, like Tamasha, Ras Leela, Nautanki, Bhavai, Jatra and Khayal, which uh, underwent a very conscious, uh, self-conscious revival uh, during the late colonial uh, and uh, pre, slightly pre and post independence periods. Um, in the uh, folk traditions, uh, there was uh, a lot of, um, there were surviving fragments of the Sanskrit dramatic tradition um, on the basis of common features like uh, preliminary rit rituals, stylized acting and gestures, stock characters like the stage director or the sutradhara and the clown or the vidushaka and of course abundant song and dance sequences. And uh, the annual festivals which were actually held in, uh, in the capital, in, Del in Delhi, uh, in some sense were also occasions to revive uh, uh, these traditions uh, of, of folk theatre. And uh, folk theatre in some sense was a conjunction, uh, um, a meeting of both song and dance as well as, as, well as drama. Right? So you couldn't quite separate drama from song and dance. Um, and uh, one of, for example, one of the most important uh, 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 post-independence playwrights, uh, the Bengali uh, playwright and director Badal Sarkar, uh, among, of course, many others like Habib Tanvir, uh, emphasized a return to uh, folk drama. Right? So this is what uh, Badal Sarkar had to say about the necessity for turning to folk uh, theatre traditions um, in, uh, in the field of modern Indian theatre. Uh, theatre is one of the fields where this rural-urban dichotomy is manifested most. The city theatre today is not a natural development of the traditional or folk theatre in the urban setting as it should have been. It is rather a new theatre having its base on western theatre. Whereas the traditional village theatre has retained most of its indigenous characteristics. Right? So he says that the city theatre today is not a natural development of the traditional or folk theatre in the urban setting as it should have been. Right? So in the process of trying to recover uh, pre-colonial uh, folk traditions that have also survived through the colonial period, the very object of folk theatre undergoes a transformation. So it's it's uh, much as these playwrights would like to believe that they have managed to recover uh, an authentic um, uh, pre-colonial uh, theatrical form called folk theatre. There are certain inevitable transformations in the process because you are drawing uh, on folk theatre traditions through the lens of colonial modernity and that, that cannot be wished away. Right? Uh, so even Habib Tanvir, another important Urdu playwright says, it is in the villages that the dramatic tradition of India in all its pristine glory and vitality remains preserved even to this day. It is these rural, rural drama groups that require real encouragement. It is not until the city youth is fully exposed to the influence of folk traditions in theatre 
that a truly Indian theater, modern and universal in appeal, and indigenous in form can really be evolved. Right? So this emphasis on exposing the younger generations of post-independence India to Indian folk theater. Right? So the belief was that uh, for these playwrights was that we should return to folk traditions and uh, draw from these traditions to make Indian theatre truly modern and universal in its appeal. Right? So the emphasis was on an indigenous form and uh, content which would uh, cater itself to the, uh, cater to the needs of modern day India. And many of these debates and discussions between Habib Tanvir, Bal Sarkar, uh, Utpal Dat, and so on, um, took place around uh, certain very important institutions uh, of uh, theater which uh, emerged in uh, post-independence India. Of course, one was the Sangeet Natak Academy. Uh, and um, there were very complex questions raised at uh, their round table on the contemporary relevance of traditional theater in 1971, where um, there were questions being raised on the relationship of rural forms to uh, modern values, right? or the role of the urban author vis-a-vis -vis an unfamiliar regional genre, and the reaction of the urban audience. Right? So in the case of folk theater, the emphasis was really on the actor, while in urban theater, uh, the emphasis was on the, uh, the playwright and the director. And uh, in the, the impulse to actually re return to the desire to return to uh, folk traditions for these playwrights was that one must then um, uh, uh, recover the communal or social spirit of theatre. So that in, it involves the masses. It is not, it's no longer being uh, performed on an enclosed private space like the proscenium arch and, uh, I and encourages the involvement of uh, rural audiences in uh, a natural setting, in a natural open mobile setting. Right? So that was the, uh, the focus of these uh, playwrights. Uh, you also see the influence that certain traditional uh, folk forms like the Tamasha had on, uh, let's say, a Marathi playwright like uh, Vijay Tendulkar, or for that matter, the importance of mythic myths uh, from the Puranas uh, on, uh, and, and the Yakshagana uh, tradition of theatre, mobile theatre on the works of Girish Karnad, or uh, Jatra on the works of the Bengali um, uh, playwright Badal Sarkar. So uh, you, for example, you see Girish Karnad's play Hayabadana which was written originally in Canada in the early 1970s, which is based on the tale of the transposed heads uh, from the Katha Sarit Sagar. And um, the play itself, Ahaya Vadana, uh, was a symbolic drama that drew a lot from uh, several conventions of Yakshagana, um, such as the half curtain, which is carried on stage to introduce new characters, and the Bhagavata or the narrator, who introduced the story and comments on the action throughout the play. And, um, or for example, uh, B.V. Karanth, another important uh, Kannada playwright uh, and uh, director. Uh, the B.V. Karanth's Hindi version of the same play, uh, again used masks uh, for the main characters and a folk style of costuming and music and songs based on folk tunes. Um, and there were other renditions of Hayabadana which did away with the folk element. So you have a very varied response uh, uh, by uh, post-independence uh, playwrights and, uh, and directors on uh, what to do with uh, folk traditions. Right? How, how can one actually use them, utilize them to uh, provide, to offer and create a truly modern form of Indian theatre. Uh, then you also had Bal Sarkar's uh, movement towards what he called a third theatre, which could be conceived as a, a theatre of rural and urban synthesis. So uh, this is what uh, Catherine Hansen says. So um, for Bal Sarkar, one had to do away with the proscenium arch to emphasize the physical movement of the actors over words and to rely upon the simplest techniques of lighting, costuming and staging. So uh, there was an attempt to try and do away with the colonial, uh, the accoutrements of colonial theatre 
and to actually uh, revive uh, uh, a more folk uh, form of theater acting, uh, which would um, uh, do with minimal lighting and costumes and involve uh, the, uh, the masses, the audiences in the play. And uh, uh, they, it would be a, a, a very social uh, and communal form of, uh, form of activity. And um, so the attempt was to try and uh, have a mode of presentation which uh, did not rely on any of the conventions of rural theatre but was still aimed at establishing within an urban context the same sense of communal involvement and ritualistic action often found in folk theatre. So you see, you can understand modern Indian theatre as a hybrid form, a form which drew from certain folk traditions, but also catering to a largely urban audience, and uh, did not entirely do away with Western conventions of, uh, of uh, dividing the play, for example, into scenes and acts, or the proscenium arch, which enabled a private, intimate viewing of theatre as a spectacle. Um, uh, the commercialization of theatre uh, and of course the uh, institutionalization of theatre uh, in terms of the printing and circulation and dissemination of uh, play scripts, screenplays. Um, Hindi and Urdu theatre, uh, for instance, uh, drew a lot from either uh, religious um, theatrical traditions, performative traditions like the Ram Leela or the Ras Leela or uh, secular traditions like the Nautanki or Swang. Um, so the main source of folk uh, influence in Hindi drama has been the Nautanki uh, together with the so-called Parsi theatre of the 19th and early 20th century right? along with the Gujarati Bhavai and the Rajasthani Khayal. Again, Nautanki and Catherine Hansen has done extensive work on the Nautanki as a musical theatrical form uh, which used sophisticated poetic meters with heavy emphasis on rhyme and rhythm. And uh, they also had uh, uh, drums uh, on the side accompanying the performance. And uh, many of these stories uh, had to do with chivalry, romance and adventure. There were also dance sequences uh, by Nach girls uh, in which were ubiquitous in these Nautanki performances. And um, uh, there, was, there was something to be said about the fact that uh, these plays uh, lacked subtlety. Right? There was a very clear opposition uh, being built between the good and the bad character. So another important uh, urban play uh, uh, presented by the National School of Drama in 1976 was Laila Majnu. Uh, which again uh, drew a lot from uh, the Nautanki uh, style of acting uh, and performance. Um, and um, uh, you had many other plays, of course, also Mudrakshas's play Ala Ala Afsar, right? Okogal's play The Inspector General, which was then adapted and translated into uh, Indian languages, into Hindi. And um, uh, many of these plays, for example, uh, the Inspector General uh, uh, was written in uh, traditional Nautanki meters, uh, like the Doha, the Chaubola, the Bahari Tawil and Dor, right, and so on and so forth. Uh, another example, of course, is also uh, Lakshmi Narayan Lal's play, Ek Satya Harish Chandra, which was first directed by M. K. Raina at the National School of Drama in 1975. Uh, the Harish Chandra story had been popular in folk theatre and in Parsi theatre, of course, as well as urban literary theatre and so on, and in film as well. And uh, the play, uh, in some sense, embeds the story of Harish Chandra uh, within a play. So it's a play within a play or a Nautanki within a play. Right? And uh, the play itself is, is a commentary on the, uh, the relationships between uh, the discriminations of uh, uh, the lower caste people. Uh, by the Harijans, uh, and um, uh, it 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 uh, it uses the Nautanki form within the play to uh, to uh, satirize uh, caste discrimination. So it is it's so the characters of the play watch a Nautanki, right? And it's in the process of watching the Nautanki that they uh, enter into the dramatic roles, they experience it, and they realize 
the, the, the mistakes they've been making uh, in, in uh, perpetuating caste injustice. So the Norton Key within the play has a moral and ethical function of revealing uh, the uh, injustices of caste to the characters in the frame play. Habib Tanvir's Urdu play uh, Agra Bazaar was also uh, highly impacted by folk uh, forms. Uh, it was first written and performed in 1954 and it was revived in the 1970s uh, in Habib Tanvir's Naya Theatre which was uh, established in Delhi and became a success with many of his other folk inspired works uh, which included Charandas Chor, uh, Indar Sabha, Prithvi, Ral Singh, Prithvi Pal Singh, uh, Ganav, Ganva Ki Naam Sasural uh, and so on and so forth. Right? So, uh, so it's important to uh, note that these playwrights Habib Tanvir and Bal Sarkar uh, did uh, were influenced by uh, folk forms and folk uh, poet poetry and it was uh, it, it played a very significant role in the um, uh, in the configuration of what is now known as the early phase of Indian modern theatre.